policy program here at the center. Um, the program, of course, has been your host for the last uh, uh, two uh, days here. We're delighted uh, that all of you are here. Um, some of you uh, for the first time here today. But um, let me just uh, also, on behalf of my program and uh, the internal co-sponsor at the Wilson Center, the Middle East program, uh, welcome you back. Thank again our uh, co-sponsors and organizers at the Conflict Research Center at National Defense University uh, with Lori Fenner as the director in the back. Uh, let me uh, make one quick announcement before I turn it over to Jim Hirschberg um, to chair the uh, uh, first session this morning. And that is to say that uh, Congressman uh, Smith uh, will not be able to, due to votes, uh, be with us uh, for lunch. So this means that you will have a, a good hour uh, for lunch uh, uh, break, um, which I hope will be in some ways uh, welcome news as well. It's ha it has been um, a full two days. And then we have a, a really uh, great session awaiting us uh, this afternoon. Uh, so with that, um, let me turn it over to uh, Jim Hirschberg, uh, known to many of you as my predecessor as director uh, of the Cold War International History Project, now of course um, professor of history and international affairs at George Washington University and uh, uh, author of a forthcoming volume on Marigold, uh, an 800-page doorstopper. Um, <laughs> Uh, with that, Jim, it's over to you. Thank you, my successor. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here with such an esteemed group on such a fascinating subject. The title of the panel is The Iran-Iraq War in the Global Cold War Context. Uh, as you know, I'm a Cold War historian. The Iran-Iraq War takes place against the backdrop of the last decade of the Cold War. And one of the fascinating things about this panel is I've long thought of the 1980s as not only the last decade of the Cold War in terms of the narratives of 20th century history, but it, in many ways it's already the first decade of the post-Cold War era. It's really the late 1970s and the revolution in Iran that brings a, a new narrative to the fore, at least in Southwest Asia, uh, the rise of, of Islamic fundamentalism as a political, and then in Afghanistan and in the Iran-Iraq War as a military force. So in many ways it's, it's an overlapping, uh, intertwined, interweaving pair of narratives of Cold War history, the fading of the Cold War story, and the rise of a new story that is not only the post-Cold War era, but the post-9-11 era that we are still living through today. This panel, I think, uh, brings some very fresh perspectives on how the East-West Cold War conflict intersected with uh, the Iran-Iraq War, and we have some distinguished uh, presenters here, um, and uh, I highly recommend uh, the paper that, that Malcolm has provided and Pierre has provided, and, and I hope that Svetlana will provide uh, in the near future. And uh, I don't know if, if uh, Sergey will also, but um, I look forward to his presentation. Malcolm Byrne, just to introduce uh, briefly, since you have the biographies, is of course the Deputy Director of the National Security Archive, an uh, extensive and prolific writer and editor on Cold War and uh, Near East subjects. Svetlana Savranskaya is her colleague dealing with uh, Soviet and Russian affairs, and she'll be speaking about the Soviet role in the Iran-Iraq War. Pierre Razou uh, from the NATO Defense College has, uh, he was telling me, worked with several governments, and, but in this case is dealing with evidence from the French archives and sources on France's role and uh, relations with Iraq during the Iran-Iraq War. And Sergei Ratchenko, one of the uh, foremost of the new generation of Cold War scholars from the former Soviet Union, is currently based at the University of Nottingham in Ningbo, China, has already published uh, an important book on the Sino-Soviet split. He'll be presenting some of the findings that he has uh, been looking at from the Gorbachev Foundation and elsewhere. But let's start with Malcolm Byrne. Uh, we'll go in order uh, for the panel. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate all of the hard work that the organizers have done. Uh, and especially the efforts that all of you have made to try to make some of these new materials available to the rest of us. This is a very important first step, and, and we applaud it. Um, I, I did, as Jim mentioned, prepare a paper. It's got a lot of detail in it, a lot more than I can possibly get through uh, now, but I'll, I'll try to give you just uh, the, the basics. Uh, 
Um, the story begins on, as far as I'm concerned, on July 13th, 14th, the night of that, uh, of the 13th and 14th, when units of Iran's Revolutionary Guard crossed over into Iraqi territory for the first time in the war. This was a huge moment for the United States because it, uh, it flagged for them the, the real possibility that an Iranian victory might be imminent. And if that were to happen, uh, in the words of Dick Murphy, who was an assistant secretary at the time, uh, that might signal um, a, a Middle East Armageddon. So these were serious stakes. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, Nick Veliotis at about this time approached uh, Lawrence Eagleburger, the deputy secretary of state, with a proposal to provide emergency aid to the Iraqis in the form of satellite intelligence or other data that could help them to forestall uh, the ongoing Iraqi, uh, Iranian attack, which the U.S. believed accurately to be aimed at cutting off Basra from the rest of the country. Uh, and so that brings us a, a short two weeks later to uh, the 27th of July when uh, CIA Near East Operations official Thomas Twetton finds himself sitting in Baghdad airport with uh, an armload of maps and imagery uh, trying to convince Iraqi intelligence officials who will come to meet him that he is not part of MI6, that he is in fact CIA, which to them is even stranger, uh, and he has to spend a little bit of time convincing them that, uh, that you know, they should listen to what he has to say. So after they drop him off at his hotel uh, in Baghdad and let him sit for a few hours, they summon him, and uh, for the, most of the rest of that first night, uh, Twetton and his American colleague uh, pour over these materials with the Iraqis, showing them what they have. Um, it's a it's a very important and and not unentertaining moment <laughs> uh, in this story, but it's only part of the story. It's where it begins. What I want to talk about very briefly is is that first part, which uh, has two phases: the the Twetton phase and then a DIA phase, uh, and then a, a second part of the story, which is even more bizarre uh, and not all that well known, which is the provision of intelligence to the Iranian side as part of the arms for hostages arrangements of Iran-Contra. Uh, so I only have time to get into some of the bare minimum uh, detail here. Um, I want to preface this by saying that uh, I'm a little bit limited by the sources involved. Um, the main reason being, of course, that this kind of information is highly sensitive and usually highly classified. And when you look uh, uh, at the part of the documentary record that does explore some of this information, which is almost entirely on the Iran-Contra side, uh, there are, you go through transcripts of depositions and, and so on, and there are huge chunks of blacked out text. Just as George Cave is about to say, well, here's what I gave them. There's three pages of excised material. So that's a, a severe limitation. Fortunately, uh, George and, and others who took part in some of these operations have uh, uh, have imparted some of their recollections uh, and impressions about what went on, and uh, that's extremely valuable. But it's also it's very personal, uh, and it is subject to all of the limitations that we know about when you're dealing with oral histories. Um, uh, valuable, but needs to be checked. Uh, and with that in mind, I would love to invite any of the people in this room who were part of this to uh, elaborate once uh, you know they, they hear what I have to say, uh, correct, you know, amend anything that, that you think is appropriate. Uh, the oral side of this, the interviews and the, uh, the oral history conferences that most of this paper is based on uh, were in large part organized or co-organized by the National Security Archive um, and in different venues, including at the Woodrow Wilson Center in 2004 and involving several of the people in this room who, for whose participation we're very grateful. All right, so let's go back to Tom Twetton, who's sweating on the tarmac in Baghdad. Um, I'm just going to talk about what we know the Americans provided to each side and a little bit about what the possible impact might have been. Um, what did Twetton bring with him? We really don't know much at all. All that Thomas said is that it was maps and imagery showing the lay of the land up to 10 or 15 miles behind uh, the battle lines. George Cave has said that typically the U.S. didn't ever turn over the top quality stuff. Uh, as he put it, it was mostly the high re uh, not the high resolution stuff, but distilled intelligence. Rick Francona, who was an Air Force intelligence officer who worked with the Iraqis towards the end of the war, 
uh, is fairly dismissive. He says it was just small amounts of low-level intelligence at this stage. Uh, but his supervisor, his superior Patrick Lang, who was the defense intelligence officer for the Middle East, uh, is a little more generous. He says, quote, they gave them things that were worth having because you have to give the people things that are worth having or they'll lose interest. Whatever it was, it was obviously sufficient to keep the Iraqis interested uh, despite uh, what Twetton calls a, a loud, seething, 45-minute lecture that he was subjected to by uh, Barzan Tikriti uh, exposing some of the rifts, perhaps, between the Muhabarat and military intelligence at the time uh, and some of the deep distrust that we, we have heard about from uh, some of the uh, speakers yesterday uh, that existed between the Iraqi side and the American side. In any event, uh, it was the start of a, a beautiful relationship for at least four years until Iran-Contra hit the, the newsstands, and we know very well, especially from Hal Brand's article and from the Iraqi documents, what impact that had on the Iraqi side. Um, after that uh, phase, the next phase was the, the start of DIA uh, activities, which were headed by Pat Lang and starting in 1987. Uh, Pat and his superior Lieutenant General Perutz from DIA tried to float this idea of providing specific battlefield intelligence to the Iraqis in 86, but at that point that the idea was turned down. But after Iran-Contra and the embarrassment that that caused for the U.S. in the, in the region, and also after the Stark incident in May of 87, uh, the, the situation changed completely and uh, top national security uh, officials approved it. And uh, Lang, who had spent a fair amount of time before then briefing uh, uh, you know, uh, Prince Bandar and other Gulf ambassadors in Washington about what was going on, um, took the next step of uh, going directly to Iraq. Actually, there was an intermediate step, which uh, Nigel probably knows about and would be interested in, which is uh, Lang being asked by Rich Armitage to go and brief King Hussein in Jordan about what was going on. So this would have been 85, possibly 86. And uh, at that point, King Hussein apparently asked, he was so impressed by what he saw that he asked, would Lang or the Americans mind if he passed this on to others? Uh, so that was really the start of it. And then uh, Lang makes, starts to make trips um, over to, um, uh, to Iraq and provides some very specific information as far as we can tell. Uh, he put together roughly 20 targets, he says, complete with target folders with all kinds of valuable information uh, to help the Iraqis decide on a new kind of strategy to take advantage of their air power uh, in a much more efficient way. Uh, what's a target folder? According to Lang, it's a, a batch of material that includes highly detailed maps, aerial imagery, uh, and what he calls many beautiful drawings done by highly talented people who he didn't even realize worked for his agency. Uh, the detail that they provided apparently was, was quite, uh, quite extraordinary, uh, and it's a, one of the very important points to know about is that, as he puts it, because the U.S. had been uh, photographing the, these areas for years, they actually had a kind of a timeline of imagery so that, for instance, one of his examples is if they were building a core headquarters behind the lines, then uh, the Iraqis were able to look at the, at least the drawings, if not the images, uh, of the progression of the construction of these facilities so they could get the entire layout, know which rooms were where, how many floors, and all that kind of thing. So that's potentially extremely valuable. Um, eventually, uh, Lang says the Iraqis started to figure this stuff out for themselves, and they drew up their own plans. Uh, so that in all, 27 or 28 missions were, were flown using uh, American intelligence in this phase. Um, and by the way, in the context of comments that we've already heard about the ineptitude of the Iraqi military, you get a very different point of view from Lang and, and Francona, and by their accounts, the French and others, who were impressed by how the Iraqis adapted uh, not only the hardware that they had access to, but also develop new uh, tactics uh, and, uh, and strategies that they used to, to really advance their cause as the war uh, dragged on. A very important question that comes up in, in connection with this part of the operation is uh, whether or not the U.S. wittingly or not contributed to Iraq's use of chemical weapons against uh, Iranians. And uh, this is a highly contested topic, as you can imagine. Lang basically says, 
I mean, he implies, yes, that they did, that it was not something that anybody wanted to contribute to, particularly um, he says that he even uh, had wanted to uh, warn the Iraqis not to, to use their material for anything that involved chemical weapons, but he claims that he was basically warned off by a civilian, uh, unnamed and probably unknown even to him, uh, but someone who had the authority to do so, who uh, sent down the message that the, the DIA should not try to weaponeer what the, Iranians, what the Iraqis were doing and leave it to them to decide what their targets are. Uh, Patrick Tyler of the New York Times wrote a very important article about this uh, and got a vehement denial from Colin Powell and others. Uh, but to, from the interviews and, and the oral history conferences that uh, we've taken part in, um, there is a, um, you know, th there's a sense that Lang's side of it really carries some weight, that as reprehensible as chemical weapons might have been, the alternative prospect of an Iraqi, uh, Iranian victory uh, was just not acceptable to uh, senior policymakers. Well, the intelligence to Iran uh, is, a, is a saga in and of itself. Uh, the key document that I would point you to is a uh, description is a cable by Deputy CIA Director John McMahon to William Casey in early 1986 when this idea first comes up. It probably comes from the Iranians. It's transferred, transmitted by Gorbanifar to Oliver North, uh, maybe late 85, early 86. Um, uh, CIA goes along with the presidential finding, which orders all kinds of assi assistance to be provided to Iran, uh, to moderate forces, so-called. And uh, this includes um, some intelligence materials. As uh, McMahon <coughs> says to Casey, they, um, let's see, we have been asked to provide a map depicting the order of battle on the Iran-Iraq border showing units, troops, tanks, electronic installations, and what have you. Pat Lang was an investigator, was a witness for DOD to the tower board, uh, and so he got access to a lot of material that, uh, uh, that he believes um, was used to to send over to the Iranians, and he says, quote, they gave them the order of battle of the entire Iraqi ar army and where it was down to brigade level for the whole front with eight-digit geographic coordinates so you knew exactly where everything was, uh, and he goes on uh, from there. McMahon and, and others at the CIA, basically everybody below the director, according to Tom Twetton, thought this was a terrible idea. McMahon says, everyone here at headquarters advises against this operation, not only because we believe the principal involved, Gorbanifar is a liar and has a record of deceit, but secondly, we would be aiding and abetting the wrong people. He says it will help the Iranians have a successful offensive with cataclysmic results, uh, and it's different from providing defensive missiles because we will be giving the Iranians, quote, the wherewithal for offensive action. Um, I'd be interested in what George and others have to say about maybe the distinction between what Pat Lang saw uh, and what actually got passed to the Iranians. It's certainly plausible that they could be two different things. Um, that was the first uh, phase was in January of 86. The, the next phase was in May of 86 during the, the famous trip to Tehran, but as I understand it, the bulk of that intelligence had to do with um, uh, purported Soviet plans or war games involving an invasion of Iran, which I won't get into right now. Then uh, in October of 86 was uh, the second phase which uh, used what they called the second channel, the nephew that George spoke about yesterday. Um, and George provided a, a pretty detailed cable to Casey about what was being requested there. Uh, one by 50,000 scale maps, location of Army, Iraqi Army Corps and Division Headquarters, 30 to 45 kilometers behind the front, location of logistical centers, main supply routes, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on for a couple more lines. Um, it, what's interesting here is that the Iranians, on several occasions in their meetings with the Americans, make it very clear that they want this stuff because they want to put on a final offensive against Iran. So at, at least from their point of view, against Iraq, uh, this is not defensive. This is offensive-oriented information as far as they're concerned. Let me move because I've probably got a minute left to uh, conclusions. Um, it's, it's a really hard call to make, especially for me. I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, but again, uh, most of the, the, uh, the data, particularly what we uh, believe exists, which is fairly accurate after action reports uh, from, um, from the U.S. military, of course not available. Uh, and so you're left with, with personal recollections, which again are really valuable, but uh, each individual has their own perspective on things and, and had their own uh, 
compartment of, of information that they were confined to, so it's a little hard to draw uh, broad conclusions. I would say that the, the first phase, the CIA phase, 82 to 86, uh, was likely to have been crucial uh, precisely because the Iranians did not succeed in cutting off Basra. The Iraqis did not lose uh, in that phase of the war, uh, and that seems to be self-evident. As a side product, um, David Newton has mentioned that uh, they, the U.S. got some very valuable information from the Iraqis as a kind of quid pro quo about uh, Abu Nidal and other terrorist organizations, which lasted for a little while. The 87 to 88 phase also seems extremely significant to me. Certainly Lang believed it had, quote, several massive effects, um, including, uh, uh, as he says, without DIA involvement, the war would have come to some kind of messy eventual stalemate. So he, he attaches great significance to it, maybe not surprisingly. Um, having said that, we don't really have the Iraqi side of things. We do have some of the documents that are out and some of the interviews by Kevin Woods and others uh, that are tantalizing but not terribly detailed, and they're a little bit contradictory. In some cases, the Iraqis say, well, yeah, we got some, but it wasn't a big deal. In other cases, there are some references to it being more significant. Uh, but again, even uh, with that, you have to add all kinds of elements, uh, other elements to the equation uh, that have nothing to do with U.S. intelligence. What about Soviet uh, assistance and Japanese assistance in, uh, in, um, uh, with SIGINT and helping to break the Iranian codes? And uh, as I mentioned, the Iraqi ability to grow and adapt and learn, uh, which also helped them um, in, their, in their war effort. On the Iran side, I, it's really not uh, very clear cut. The first batch, I would go along with the, the notion that it really wasn't very significant at all, may even have been doctored to make it less uh, important. Um, and uh, uh, as for the second batch in October, if the goal was to uh, put together a final offensive, that obviously went nowhere, so you could argue that that also was, uh, was not very significant. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, let's turn now to uh, one of America's NATO allies, or at least a quasi-ally ally in a military sense, France. Pierre. Thank you very much. Well, indeed, uh, if the U.S., Soviet Union, and China analyzed the Iran-Iraq war through the prisma of the Cold War, it was not at all, not at all the case for the European countries. On the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, we considered, I would say collectively, most of the European countries, that uh, this war was not a classical proxy war. It was not uh, a war, uh, let's say, like the Arab-Israeli war, like the Vietnam war, etc., where, let's say, the West uh, was fighting uh, the Soviets or the communists. It was totally different. So because of that, each European country played its own role and decided to keep its own interest and to defend its own interest. So it was a totally different approach from uh, yours, for example. And the general view was that um, the U.S. definitely was not backing neither Iran nor Iraq, and that Soviet Union had difficult relations both with Iran and Iraq. So, well, uh, the general impression was we have a chance and we have a, play, a, a card to play, so uh, let's do business. And it was really what was the uh, the motto uh, during this year and especially for France the main uh, challenge was how to preserve our interest with Iraq without jeopardizing our relation with Iran and it was really the main uh, the main point so uh, my plan is very simple I will try to explain you why uh, first uh, did France back uh, backs Iraq or backed Iraq so strongly and then uh, why did we uh, moderate our attitude uh, in the middle uh, of the war? My sources are uh, not at all the, the Saddam tales or the, your archives, but our archives, which mean mainly or I had a full access to all the French military archives, including the military intelligence uh, during this period. I had a special permission 
to uh, to have an entire look on uh, the uh, thousands of pages uh, we produced uh, on this event. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot quote them because uh, I was uh, like um, Nigel. I was very lucky to have uh, this uh, special access. Then I had and I interviewed probably something like 50, uh, 50 authorities, top authorities, both in the secret services, in the government, in the army, in the procurement area, let's say, to shape the, the, the scope of <coughs> our cooperation, and also just open sources uh, of excellent books and, article pu and articles published in French, but um, not uh, translated uh, into English, so they are not uh, quoted and not well known uh, on this side uh, of uh, Atlantic. So why did we back so, uh, Iraq so strongly at the beginning? I think it's quite uh, simple. <coughs> I would say it was clearly because of business interests and the weight of three of the most influential lobbies in France. Sorry, in France. The first one was the oil industry, then the industrial military lobby, and then the nuclear industry. I will come back a bit later. So clearly between 1972 and 1980, for eight years, Iraq became a real Eldorado for French industrialists. Iran was an Eldorado for uh, US and British industrialists. Iraq was an Eldorado for the French industrialists. Other reasons can also be given uh, to explain uh, our backing to Iraq. Uh, the another one, or the first one, is, of course, the need to stop Soviet expansionism toward the Gulf region. It was one of the motto of President Giscard d'Estaing, who feared that the Soviet Union would or could change its allegiance and could support Iran if uh, Iran would win uh, the Iran-Iraq war, and, of course, seeing the Soviets arriving to the Gulf would be uh, or was perceived at the time as uh, a real threat on our uh, oil access. The second reason was also to contain Ira Iranian expansionism by all means because, of course, we uh, collectively, I would say, in Europe, were quite afraid of the, uh, let's say, the, the, the message conveyed by the new Islamic uh, authorities uh, in Tehran at the time. Another reason was, of course, clearly to protect French access to the Gulf oil resources. Uh, and I would say that uh, the last reason was the need to back strongly Iraq, which was perceived as the most powerful secular and modernist Arab regime. It was a constant since uh, the, I would say the late 60s when France uh, swapped and changed its policy toward the Middle East. Let's say that in the 50s and the beginning of the 60s, uh, France backed strongly Israel. Then uh, when we divorced from Israel and when Israel got married with the US, definitely uh, we or the, the French leadership decided to change alliance and to, to develop a real uh, Arab policy. So it was the consequences of that. Just to give you a flavor, and what was very also in, in interesting is that this, uh, let's say, not alliance, because it, ne it has never been an alliance, but this rapprochement with Iraq was consensual, which means both the Gaullist party and the socialist and the communist party backed this rapprochement very strongly. <laughs> This is why uh, it never uh, created, I would say, any political issue uh, on the French government or on the French parliament. There was really a large consensus to uh, run uh, this policy. And to give you a flavor of this consensus, you have two, uh, two uh, declarations made at six years of uh, distance. The first one by uh, Jacques Chirac when he used to be prime minister, when he received the first time uh, Saddam Hussein for his big visits in France and he said you are my personal friend I trust you you can be assured of my esteem my deep consideration and my sincere affection and of course this was the time when we began to to, uh, <coughs> to deal with serious business <coughs> 
And six years after, the, the Claude Chesson, who was the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, a, social, a socialist one, said, to contain the fanatical expansion of Iran, which treats and threats the whole Arab world, France strongly backs Iran and will always back Iran. Uh, sorry, strongly backs Iraq and will always back Iraq. So it gives you the, 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 the sensation that it was really a consensual policy. The different steps in this rapprochement began, so in 67, when President de Gaulle made public his new pro-Arab policy, <coughs> so after the divorce with Israel, uh, I talk about this. Then, uh, the, the year after, uh, the Iraqi president, Aref at the time, visited France, and we began to have talks and discussion. At the time, it was just talks, because Iraq was perceived as clearly, at the time, as still a very pro-Soviet, let's say, allied or puppet. So in, in Paris, people were very uh, prudent. And they say, okay, uh, let's try, let's have a talk. And it proved to be uh, fruitful and to be uh, interesting. And so the real, uh, the real uh, let's say, uh, cooperation began in 72 when uh, Saddam Hussein visited for the first time uh, France and it was the beginning of the cooperation first in the oil sector. You have to understand that why uh, the cooperation went so far with Iraq, it was because of these three lobbies. And the Iraqis were sufficiently uh, shrewd and smart, in fact, like in a poker game, to attract us and to attract the French government. First they say, okay, we are going to begin with oil uh, cooperation. And they said, you, when will, so we knew far in advance that the Iraqis uh, had in mind to, uh, to nationalize their oil industry. And they told them, don't worry, when we, will nationalize, sorry, when we will nationalize our oil industry, you will be put in a very favorable state and you will have access to a lot of things. <laughs> so we said, okay. And in 72, 73, when it happened, France made a series of uh, very interesting deal with uh, Iraq, and uh, as a consequence, during the Yom Kippur War and during the first oil embargo, France was not very well uh, attained and affected by this embargo, thanks to the, the, the Iraqi attitude at the time. Then the Iraqis said, okay, now that we have the oil, and that you, French, you have the oil, we need the weapons. So, and of course, if you do not give us the weapons, we could reconsider our oil policy. So, with the time, the French government said, okay, uh, let's go in this direction, and we are giving you first defensive weapons, and then when President Pompidou left, and when uh, President Giscard d'Estaing and Prime Minister Chirac arrived to the power, they said, okay, we have to, to really go into this direction, and we sell them Mirage, etc. By the way, the, the famous contract of the uh, F1, uh, the Mirage F1 fighters, was signed in different batches in 75, 76, 77, but they were never delivered mm -hmm. between 81. So it means that at the very beginning of the Iran Iraq war, during the first six months, uh, the Iraqis just had the Soviet fighters and they received, they began to receive the Mirage F1 only between February and the spring of uh, 81. And then when the, when the Iraqis uh, had, or when we sold to the Iraqis, when we had the access to oil and when we sold them weapons, they come back and Saddam Hussein come back and said, oh, by the way, we have a good news. We are interested in, in nuclear issue. And, and of course, uh, for us, it's vital. So it means that if you do not cooperate with us in the nuclear field, we could uh, reconsider all our oil and weapon contract. So we were really trapped like in a poker game. And finally, uh, the government and the industrialists progressively have put the finger, the hand, the arm, and we went totally uh, pasted and trapped uh, in this uh, cooperation with Iraq. So we gave them and we sold them a lot of items you will see all, if you are interested, you will see all the figures in the paper that uh, you, you, you will see there. So, uh, 
the the big contracts uh, where the Mirage F1, the Super Frolon, the uh, helicopter Gazelle, and then different issues. Let's say that by the end of the war, because of course it was just to give you a flavor, we sold them 126 combat aircraft, uh, nearly 160 helicopters, 560 armored vehicles, and 81 heavy mobile guns, and more than 15,000 missiles, plus a lot of electronic devices, radars, etc., etc. Everything for 22 billion of dollars in terms of 1988. So why? But the problem was that, of course, we backed very strongly Iraq, and the Iraqis were very happy with our cooperation. But in 83, 84, France and the French government, which was socialist at the time, began to moderate and to soften uh, its attitude toward Iraq. Why? For different reasons. The first one was that Iraq was largely bankrupt and could not pay its debt. Beginning in 83, when, for example, Tarek Aziz, because, because he came every three, three months or four months to Paris to try to make new contracts, new deals, etc., etc., but he began to say, we, 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 you know, we have some difficulties. So if you could postpone the debt, uh, we would be very grateful. So, of course, at the beginning, the French government said, yes, no problem. But uh, when we, it became regular and when the Iraqis stopped paying, of course, the French authorities and the French industrialists said, well, now it's becoming very uh, problematic. And by the end of the, uh, of the war, uh, we had our Iraq had a debt of something like nearly uh, six billions of dollars uh, to the French government. And uh, it went a lot of years to, to pay this. The second reason was, of course, because France uh, was very keen to ease tensions with Iran because we had a lot of tensions with Iran during the 80s. And these tensions um, materialized by the kidnapping of French people uh, in uh, Beirut and in Lebanon, exactly like uh, it was the case for the US and materialized in different bomb attacks, uh, both in uh, the aiming the French interest in Lebanon and also uh, directly on the French soil. And uh, I will give you at the end the, the total sum, but so it was very nasty. And the four main, uh, let's say, tensions that we had with Iran was the first one that was the Eurodif affair. It was linked with our nuclear cooperation at the time of the Shah with Iran. I can develop and elaborate a bit more during the Q&A <laughs> period if you are interested. The second one was a detention in a French jail of Anis Nakash, who was the head of the commando who tried to assassinate Shapur Bakhtiar in, the, in the 1980 uh, in Paris. The third, the third uh, main reason was I saw the hosting of Bani Sadr and uh, Massoud Rajavi uh, in France. When they left uh, Iran in 81, uh, they found uh, an uh, asylum uh, in Paris, and they began to, to play their, their role in Paris from this time, and of course the Iranians were furious. And of course the France, uh, the France is backing uh, of uh, Iraq. Another reason was that Iraq, in the French views, Iraq had lost some international legitimacy after using massively the chemical weapons. And so uh, the French government find quite difficult to openly back very strongly a country <coughs> using uh, chemical weapons at the time when we try to convince the Soviets not to use them or, let's say, to, to uh, marginalize them during the, the Cold War potential uh, fight in the potential, uh, let's say, central front. And the last reason was because of the Lucher affair. The Lucher affair was the French Iron Gate. Mm. So it was um, uh, a scandalous, which means that the, 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 it proved that uh, a company, a French company, sold a lot of uh, <laughs> ammunition to the Iranians to finance, le first to make money, of course, but then also to finance the Socialist Party, which was a ruling party at the time, yeah, in 86. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was between 84, it began in fact in 82 up to 86. 
And it was really a, a scandalous affair, uh, exactly like the Iran Gate. It was by the, in France, in the, in the French newspaper, it was called uh, by the, the French new, uh, Iron Gate. And uh, it proved extremely problematic for the French uh, government. And just to conclude, I would say that for us, the Iran or for France, the Iran Iraq war had a tremendous impact because it creating devastating uh, affairs for the various governments, both Gaullist and socialist. And it created an unstable and insecure environment for our whole population because during these eight years of uh, Iran Iraq war, when France and the US uh, fought, uh, I would say, uh, an undercover war against Iran, mainly in Iran, in, in Lebanon and in other places. We had 15 French civil, uh, sorry, 15 <coughs> French citizens which were taken in hostage, two were killed. We had 100 uh, French civilian, uh, French citizens killed, including diplomats, uh, military people, uh, and soldiers based in Lebanon and in France. And we had 500 people who were severely, severely injured during different bomb attacks. So the, for us, at the end, the main question was, at the very balance, all the money we gained uh, for industrial reasons was put into balance with all these, uh, I would say, uh, human uh, losses. So this is just for your reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre, for illuminating this uh, fairly little-known dimension uh, of the international history of the Iran-Iraq War. Let's now turn to the other side of the Cold War and uh, begin with Svetlana Severanskaya. Thank you very much. Um, um, I am honored to be at this very impressive gathering of real experts on the Iran-Iraq War, which is a relatively new subject uh, for me. I will talk a little bit about the Soviet Union and its role in um, Iran-Iraq War, but especially about um, different changes, different three periods in the Soviet uh, policy toward the war. The role was actually, I would say, not that great. Um, but the Soviet Union, in my opinion, um, looking at the sources that I had access to, proved itself to be a really good international citizen and um, followed the policy that they actually declared um, used mainly economic and political resources and open diplomacy uh, for the goal that they declared actually early on, right after the Iraqi invasion of um, Iran, to bring the war to an end, um, and preferably on the basis of status quo antebellum. I would argue that um, the most interesting part of the story in the Iran-Iraq war, the Soviet angle of that story, is the actual changing um, policy, even though the main objective to end the war remains the same. Um, another major finding that I <laughs> saw in the, in the Soviet documents, and I looked at <coughs> Uh, practically entire set of the Politburo documents from 1985 through 1989 because a lot of Soviet story uh, relating to Iran Iraq war actually happens after um, the ceasefire in September 88. So what I found is that the Soviets were incredibly consistent um, speaking about Iran Iraq war domestically. Um, Gorbachev within his circle of advisors and Gorbachev to the Politburo and internationally, um, especially when they're talking to Iranian and Iraqi representatives and to Secretary Schultz. Um, just to uh, walk you through very quickly, and I will concentrate mainly on the Gorbachev period um, in the Soviet policy toward the Iran-Iraq war, because that's the bulk of documents that I was able to see. There is very little, almost nothing available other than memoirs on the earlier policy, um, the Brezhnev and Andropov and Chernyenko policy toward Iraq. The invasion itself was a disaster for the Soviet Union and for the Soviet interests in the, in the Persian Gulf. It was also uh, seen especially by the uh, Soviet Arabists and by the Soviet Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs as a humiliation because Iraq 
was the Soviet ally, uh, Soviet client. Iraq was uh, the second biggest recipient of um, Soviet special equipment sales, which is military sales. <laughs> and a large part of Soviet Arabs thought that they could manage Iraq, that that relationship was stable, and suddenly uh, Iraq destabilizes the situation by invading Iran, knowing that the Soviets were strongly opposed to that. So the Soviet Union is faced with a really tough set of choices. At the time, the Soviets were hoping to use the Iranian Revolution and the major loss that the United States suffered in the region to reestablish its own role. But here in this conflict, they did not want either side to win. Um, they did not want a strong and uncontrollable Iraq in the area. They did not want a weak Iran that would um, um, clearly undermine the Soviet push toward the major role in the Gulf. So uh, another complicating factor, of course, was that uh, both Syria and Libya in this conflict were leaning toward Iran, and the Soviets had major interests in both countries. In fact, Syria is number one purchaser of Soviet arms. So in the first period of the war, the Soviet Union um, follow strict policy of neutrality. They stop arms sales to Iraq. And actually, in a very unusual um, development, when Tariq Aziz comes to Moscow in June um, 1982, they refuse to meet with him. He comes, of course, to talk about the expansion of um, military uh, trade and uh, tries to talk the, his Soviet counterparts in supporting Iraq. Uh, taking a more clear position in the war, and they just refused to see him. So then after 1982, as Iraq uh, scores some military victories, the Soviets start moving toward the Iraqi side, but just trying to balance, basically having no active policy. When Gorbachev comes to power in 1985, something very interesting happens. <coughs> Gorbachev and his leadership uh, uses the discontent that was already building in the Soviet foreign policy circles and within the Central Committee for very one-sided approach to, very one-sided and ideological approach to the Middle East, which meant that the Soviet Union really did not have any serious allies. And in 95, especially in 96 and early 97, 80, 80, 80 I am sorry, yes, um, 85, 86, 87, there is a very assertive new tone in the Soviet uh, policy toward the third world. And I think you can really only understand the Soviet policy toward the Iran-Iraq war within this context of re, uh, rethinking, readjusting the entire Soviet strategy toward the third world. And what it meant is that the Soviets decided um, then rather than relying on small revolutionary ideological radical allies, especially in the Gulf, but throughout the Third World, they would be establishing and expanding relations with important big states. And in the, in the Gulf, in the Middle East, it meant primarily conservative uh, Arab states, especially Saudi Arabia. Um, in this period um, of two and a half or three years, what you see is that the Soviets actually believe that they can play an active role and diminish or push away the U.S. influence in the Gulf. And you see this in um, their, ef their efforts to establish relations with all the countries in the Gulf, but especially the more important countries, and also their new activism toward Iran. Uh, for example, in February 1986, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Georgi Karnienko travels to Iran and signs several trade agreements, uh, talks about improvement of relations. This visit is considered to be uh, very substantive and successful, and is seen as a model of what the Soviets would do in the region, approaching the countries with which they uh, used to have problems. But Iran is an especially important country also because it is on the border of the Soviet Union, has some influence over the Central Asian Muslims, 
and uh, the Soviets are hoping that Iran could play a positive role in the settlement in Afghanistan. So in this period, what you hear in the Politburo context is statements like this. Uh, Gorbachev, for example, speaks um, in 1986 uh, at the Politburo. America is losing positions in this region, meaning the Middle East, and we can use this opportunity in our contacts with Hussein, with Saudis, and others. Um, um, later, in the first part of 1987, uh, Varantsov, uh, the Soviet representative, says, our goal is to push the United States politically. Then he says, economically will not work. Uh, the United States is stepping up their activity in, th in this region. We have to push them away. We have to use the non-aligned movement. In other words, step up our activity on all the directions. But the means to do that are not military means. Uh, these are mainly political and economic means. Um, therefore, the Soviets are relying on bilateral relationships. There are lots of meetings at lower levels with Iranian representatives and Iraqi representatives. The Soviets are still selling much more weapons to Iraq, and in 86, early 87, you see the uh, pretty strong pro-Iraqi stance, and yet they're trying to keep their channels of communication open with Iran. <coughs> um, for example, when Iranians uh, come to Moscow in February 1987, Velayati uh, comes and asks for assistance in developing defense industries. Um, there is a big discussion in the Politburo throughout March 1987, but um, Gorbachev sums up that discussion by saying, we should not agree to his proposals now, but we should not push Iran away completely, not to eliminate an opportunity for such cooperation later. This approach, the approach of bilateral contacts with Iran and with Iraq, trying to balance them, trying to push pressure on both to put the war to the end, actually was followed through and it was supported by the um, more or less old guard, people like uh, Kornienko, uh, uh, Ar Arabists in the Foreign Ministry, and Evgeny Primakov. Primakov especially believed that he knew Saddam Hussein personally, that he could talk to him, that Saddam was a rational actor, and so they could negotiate with them. Well, not very much comes out of that policy. By mid-1987, two things happen. There is an, a reassessment. First of all, the Soviets look at their contacts throughout the Middle East, also throughout the Third World, and realize that they simply do not have enough economic resources to support this new assertiveness, this new big role in the third world, and especially in the Middle East. And the second development that happens is that the U.S.-Soviet relations improve to the level where Gorbachev begins to trust his American counterparts more than he trusts even his former, even his socialist allies, let alone the uh, clients in the Middle East. So somewhere <clears throat> around mid-1987, there is a realization that actually the best way to attain the um, ultimate objective to bring the war to the end uh, without any side clearly winning is in negotiations with the Americans, and especially between Shevardnadze, Gorbachev, and Schultz. By this time, we already have the meeting in Reykjavik. We have the visit uh, by Schultz to Moscow in 19, April 1987, where they talk mainly about arms control, but also a lot about uh, regional conflicts. Margaret Thatcher also comes to Moscow in April 1987, and she and Gorbachev um, <coughs> engage in a uh, very extensive discussion of the third world conflict. There is this shift toward a, a more global, more systematic vision of ending the Cold War and within that framework resolving regional conflicts at the very high level by negotiating primarily with the Americans. And um, that is actually quite a significant shift, which is not immediately and not immediately supported by the old guard, not immediately supported by the experts, especially in uh, the foreign ministry. 
Um, and you see even more of that gap, that split, by the time uh, of the of Persian Gulf War after uh, Iraq invades Kuwait. But this helps uh, Soviet Union to support the United States in um, the United Nations and in really uh, makes it possible for both of them to uh, work together on the re on the resolution 598. Another interesting element is that now it seems like the Soviets put their representatives from the Middle East, from Iran and Iraq especially, to meet with lower level representatives and not with Gorbachev and not with Shevardnadze, even though Vorontsov keeps going on the missions to both countries, still you can see that the main uh, venue is the negotiations with the Americans. In August um, 1987, um, August 14, 1987, actually, I found a very interesting memo from Chernyaev, who was Gorbachev's foreign policy advisor to Gorbachev, saying today Colonel General Dikov came and left with me the first daily report on the Persian Gulf. He promised, and that's on orders from Minister of Defense Yazov, he promised that he would come <coughs> and brief you every morning. So from uh, at least August 14, 1987, the priority of uh, Persian Gulf and, the, and ending the war in Iraq <coughs> becomes uh, big enough so that Gorbachev decides he will be briefed every day by a military representative. Unfortunately, those memos themselves are not available. They would be in the military archives, but I had no access to them. <coughs> then two very important meetings happened between Gorbachev and Schultz in which at least one-fourth of the meeting was devoted to the events in the Middle East and specifically on Iran-Iraq. Conversations are sincere, they are very direct, they raise um, even uncomfortable issues like U.S. Uh, anti-Iranian um, uh, pressure on the region and on the Soviet Union, and uh, they also mentioned that uh, before they met, uh, before Gorbachev and Schultz met, Shevardnadze and Schultz talked about the Persian Gulf, about the war in, uh, between Iran and Iraq, until midnight, and that the conversation was very sharp. So what's the complaint? The Soviets agreed with the United States to pass the Resolution 598, um, but they did not agree with the United States to immediately pass another resolution which would um, establish arms embargo against the side that violated or did not comply with the first resolution, which Soviets understood would be an anti-Iranian action. And they really wanted to keep their channels open with Iran and expand, actually, their relations with Iran. So Gorbachev complains to Schultz <coughs> about the United States taking the Iraqi side too strongly and trying to create an anti-Iranian coalition. He says, I know it's emotional, I know um, you feel threatened by Iraqi influence in the region, but, you know, let's, let's approach them in a balanced way. Uh, I, we know you're offended by our refusal to consider sanctions because that would be essentially anti-Iranian sanctions. Gorbachev also... He now treats this uh, uh, effort to, uh, to mediate as the test case for U.S.-Soviet interaction because for him, he now believes that many regional conflicts could be resolved in this framework of negotiating with Schultz. So again and again and again, especially in that conversation in September 1987, but again in February 1988, uh, Gorbachev stresses the importance of this case as a major, the freshest example. Um, this is the freshest example proving the possibility of constructive collaboration between the USSR and the USA in resolving acute international problems. So he's saying this is a non-ideological issue. It's an easy issue because we have very similar uh, very similar interests in the outcome to bring the war to the end, yet he begins to suspect that the United States also has uh, 
another motive to weaken Iran substantially and to increase U.S. military presence in the Gulf, which is actually what they see happening. The Soviet Union is the first to respond to Kuwaiti request to reflag the tankers, um, responds practically immediately. And this is, again, within the framework of policy of establishing relations with uh, more important Gulf states. Following the Soviet Union, and partly because the Soviet Union agreed and the United States was unhappy with the expanding Soviet role in the Persian Gulf, then grudgingly the United States decides to do the same, reflag the tankers, but sends a much bigger number of um, the, uh, military ships into the region. And the Soviets raise objections against that. Um, in the United Nations, directly to American representatives, to Schultz in February 1988, and to Reagan when Reagan comes to Moscow in 1988. Um, eventually, however, uh, the Soviets and the Americans are able to cooperate through the United Nations to bring the ceasefire and uh, this is clearly seen as a success in the Soviet Union. But for the Soviet Union, it is not the end of the story. For the Soviet Union now, it is an opportunity to truly pursue the policy of uh, economic and political expansion in the Middle East. And already in, in early 1989, you see a flurry of visits, especially from Iran, Iranian representatives, um, in January, March, uh, June, you have meetings with uh, Gorbachev and Javadi, Gorbachev and Velayati, Gorbachev and Rafsanjani, talking about a whole range of issues, Afghanistan, but very importantly, economic cooperation and cooperation in building reactors. Um, so just to conclude, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, they referred to it always as the Persian Gulf War in the Soviet documents, always referred to as the Persian Gulf War, not Iran-Iraq War. But it was a successful test where the United States and the Soviet Union were able to collaborate in bringing about the result. But also importantly is that the Soviet proclaimed goals and the discussions internally uh, were consistent and were extremely averse to the use of military force. That is partly why the Soviet Union never tried to use the Iran-Iraq war to actually increase their presence in the Persian Gulf, which was a major concern by the United States. And um, I would like to conclude by saying, actually by quoting uh, Ray Gartov, that um, the Soviet Union tried to balance um, the two sides of the war openly using non-military um, instruments. The United States was unsuccessful at attempting to do the same thing through clandestine diplomacy and intelligence sharing with Iraq and arms transfers to Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Sveta. And uh, just as a point of information for a context uh, of some of what Sveta was talking about, there was recently a conference in London and, and a subsequent book co-edited by Sergei uh, Radchenko and Artem <coughs> Kalinowski on the end of the Cold War in the Third World in the, 1980, in the late 1980s. So um, some of you might find that interesting. Let me uh, now pass the floor to Sergei for more on the Soviet side of this equation. Um, thank you, Jim. Actually, I'm, I'm supposed to offer some comments on the, on the um, panel, but since, since you invited me to uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the Soviet side, then maybe I will. And, and let me just mention, Sergey, in addition to authoring uh, Two Sons in the Heavens, the <coughs> Sino-Soviet Struggle for Supremacy in the 1960s, uh, has completed a manuscript on Soviet policy, uh, and especially under Gorbachev, toward Asia in the 1980s. So go ahead. Um, Yes, so I, I will I will say a few things, and uh, uh, also uh, using an opportunity of, of, of sort of representing China in a sense here. I will also talk about the Chinese policy a little bit towards you know in the in the context of the Iran Iraq War. So, but but I would like to kind of engage uh, uh, directly with Sveta on some of the s issues that she raised. I find that 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 my own assessment um, of um, Soviet policy towards the Iran-Iraq war is, is, is less optimistic, as it were. Um, and I would disagree with some of the things that she said. But I would agree in, in some important things. Uh, and I would like to start by 
by noting the grand ideas or talking, you saying a few things about the grand ideas that Gorbachev uh, brought into office when he ascended power in the Kremlin in March 1985. Uh, one of the grand ideas that he had with regard to the Middle East was the notion that somehow the Soviet Union could sponsor Arab unity. Uh, it, it's really surprising, and, and you would think, well, how, how did he think that he could ever achieve something like that when the idea had been tried and, and failed you know, back in the 1950s? But if you look at the Soviet record of all the meetings that, he, that the Soviets are having with different <coughs> countries in the Middle East, one, one theme that comes out in almost every meeting is, you Arabs, you have to unite etc. We have to have Arab unity. Um, Gorbachev had a propensity, I think, for quick fixes, grand ideas that sometimes in close inspection did not really work. Uh, and this was one of those grand ideas. And of course, it was anti-American in its essence, as I would agree with Sveta, a lot of Gorbachev's early initiatives were anti-American. Um, <clears throat> in other words, he was hoping to use uh, 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 so-called Arab unity, which was any, anyhow not achievable, but he was hoping to use it to uh, undermine American interests in the Middle East. In this sense, this grand idea is very similar to the um, other grand concept that Gorbachev was trying to peddle beginning from 1985 and certainly in 86 and 87, and this is the so-called Sino-Soviet Indian Strategic Triangle. Uh, he was engaging with the Indians. Every time he met with Rajiv Gandhi, he would talk about the strategic triangle, bringing the Chinese, <laughs> opposing the American interests in South Asia, etc., without really understanding how this concept was going to work. Actually, in retrospect, one should say that this uh, triangular idea worked better uh, uh, than, than the idea of Arab unity. Uh, as far as you know, the grand fixes are concerned in Gorbachev's thinking. So there was a lot of wishful thinking, I think. Um, now, there was a change in this, and Sveta correctly talked about it. Change in Soviet foreign policy generally so towards the Third World and certainly towards the Middle East. I would disagree, perhaps, concerning the actual dating of this shift. I'm more inclined to see a uh, real shift happening in 88, 89. So we had a date a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, would, I, would, uh, I would say that the main reason for the shift in Gorbachev's position uh, towards the Middle East was the overriding imperative of uh, the Afghan settlement and not even the withdrawal of, of, from Afghanistan, of course, you know, or the, or the settlement itself, uh, as, uh, as, as the whole idea, you know, as to how to preserve Najibullah's regime once the Soviet forces leave. And Iran is crucial to this whole undertaking. So that is why in early 1989, the Soviets really go after Iran in a major way, in a way that they had not done throughout the Iran-Iraq war, when they were basically, um, and here I would disagree with Sveta, I think they were really kind of uh, uh, backing Iraq in a major way. I mean, we have the military figure, certainly. And I would say that actually Iraq was the number one recipient of Soviet military aid. Uh, Syria is the first. I think Syria was second. All right. But anyway, but 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 it's 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 huge. It's huge. I mean, I, I'm I'm just looking at the figures here, and we're talking about from 81 to 85, 7.7 .7 billion rubles, mm -hmm. um, and then from 86 to 90, 5.4 billion rubles or so, um, uh, uh, which Syria been close close behind. So there was a huge Soviet uh, interest in this sense in Iraq, just you know interest as well you know, of, 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 of merchant, uh, merchant nature or commercial nature, as Pierre would understand. Uh, <clears throat> and then in the Afghanistan issue uh, changes all of that. In 89, uh, early 1989, the Soviet Union really tries to um, mend fences with Iran. We have this great um, uh, record of, of, the, of, of the first visit by Soviet foreign minister, that's I'm Shevardnadze, going to Tehran and meeting with Khomeini, which was really entertaining. I mean, the whole, the whole setup was really funny. Actually, he went to Baghdad first, or went to Basra and met with uh, Saddam Hussein there. And uh, he was kind of asking permission from Saddam to go and engage in with Iran in this kind of uh, you know, direct way. 
<clears throat> and Saddam was, of course, unhappy. They had this very interesting meeting where, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, Saddam in the end said, okay, well, Allah help you, but I hope it's going to be the Iraqi Allah and not the Iranian Allah. <laughs> um, and then, and, and, and then a, a, you know, Shevardnadze goes to um, uh, Iran in the background to that. And here's where I'm not really sure how this whole rapprochement happened. The background to that is that uh, Khomeini, of course, sends a secret me or a messenger to, to, to Moscow who uh, bears a personal uh, letter to Gorbachev. And the, uh, and the messenger uh, meets with Gorbachev and the letter is read out. And in this letter, Khomeini says very strange things mm -hmm. uh, about... Uh, about uh, you know how the Soviet Union needs to defeat communism, et cetera, et cetera, because of evil ide ideology. Yeah. Um, and Gorbachev was really surprised. And later, as he describes it, yeah. and the Politburo meeting says, <laughs> actually, before he even goes into that, uh, you know, the, the Politburo they actually laugh about it, saying, you know, uh, Khomeini was trying to persuade us to abandon communism. But after that, of course, you know, Shevardnadze goes with a return message to Khomeini. Meets, uh, uh, he arrives in Tehran. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and is taken to this house, and he's told uh, that Khomeini will meet with you for 15 minutes. Now, that's all. Uh, but don't you dare raise the issue of the satanic verses with him. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so Shevardnadze so goes into this meeting with Khomeini, and, uh, 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 and then he kind of gives this Gorbachev-style reply to the, uh, to the message that, uh, that Khomeini had said, uh, you know, talking about the need, uh, you know, the human value, or what do you call it, the uh, universal, human. universal human values, thank you, and all these other things, you know, reconciliation and blah, 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 and, uh, and talks for 20 minutes. And then Khomeini basically uh, uh, says, well, that's not what I expected. I wanted to talk about spiritual issues, turns his back to Shevardnadze and walks out of the room. Shevardnadze is just dumbfounded. <laughs> He's totally dumbfounded by all of that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but, but in the end, it's actually the whole thing is settled because, uh, uh, because later the Iranians let, uh, let the Soviets know that actually they viewed the, the visit as a success and that Khomeini just needed to walk out because doctors tell him not to spend too much time in eating. Anyway, <coughs> that's, just a, that's just a side issue. But this, this whole engagement between the Soviet Union and Iran, in my view, is not so much related to uh, Gorbachev's uh, imperative of, uh, you know, the dialogue with the United States, although I think this is also very important, but more general or more specifically, the, the, the whole imperative of, of uh, uh, preserving the Afghan regime after the Soviet withdrawal. I think especially just the timing coincides so closely. It's, it seems to be very crucial here. Um, uh, also on the Soviet, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, and I, I'm not sure what to say about it. I don't, we don't have so much on the Soviet uh, records of of their meetings with the Iraqis in the in the late 80s. I think we have much or in the mid 80s. More on Iran, but also more on Iran. A yeah. little bit on but Iraq. There is well, there is a lot on Iraq after the invasion. You yes. Know, then there are phone calls and meetings. Yes, and yes, all. absolutely. But there is a little bit on Iraqi. Um, I can show you. Because I'm 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 interested, for example, in you know some of the some of uh, Soviet decisions, like for example about selling. Uh, missiles to Iraq, uh, which of course proved uh, very crucial at the later stages of war um, to 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 the Iraqis. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it's it it, it shows it shows uh, um, uh, Soviet policy in more negative light than you would um, otherwise. You know, that, than you present. But this is just a small point of disagreement here. Um, now, I would like to uh, I would like to say something about the, about uh, 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 about Chinese policy. And here, um, it's interesting um, that uh, there's this idea that big powers, great powers, were, as Kissinger would put it. Uh, hoping that both sides, or we're hoping that both sides would lose, and Sveta just said the same thing about the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was also in the same position, which I would not entirely agree. I think the U.S. was certainly in this position, but China was, of all players, 
probably not in this position at all. And we see actually evolution in Chinese policy towards Iran and Iraq in the 1980s. In, in, the, in the late 70s, of course, China, Deng Xiaoping at that time, was obsessed, absolutely obsessed with what he called the Soviet, Soviet Union's barbell strategy, which, you know, which, uh, uh, by which he understood Soviet expansion on the one hand through Southeast Asia to capture the Malacca Straits of all places. Uh, and the other, um, and on the other, the other side of the barbell was Soviet reach out towards uh, uh, the Persian Gulf, and and he was really pushing the Americans uh, uh, in 1980, already after or during the hostage crisis, um, uh, uh, to be soft on Iran, and not uh, not to allow the Soviet Union benefit from the situation. When uh, Harold Brown visited uh, Beijing in, in January 1980, a lot of his discussions with Deng Xiaoping and uh, Huang Hua and other pe and other people focused on the Iran issue, and uh, the Chinese resisted the American uh, uh, pressure on Iran, it did not want to join the sanction. Interestingly, uh, what happened in the, in the mid-1980s is Chinese overall policy, I think, changed towards, or I would say, you know, they, they, they began to hope that both sides would win in this conflict. Not that both would lose, but both would win. And this connects very well to Chinese efforts uh, to, um, engage with the third world in the 1980s uh, and to peddle the so-called development discourse. The Chinese, for a Deng opinion, meeting with Raf Sanjani, for example, in June of 1985, uh, talked about this issue. And uh, he would tell them, well, why are you fighting with the Iraqis? Why don't you just focus on development? Uh, uh, why don't you just use this opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, while this, uh, the world situation seems to be improving in some ways, as he uh, told the Iranians actually by 1989, to really start up development uh, of, of your country. And this, I think, shows that Deng Xiaoping, in, in, in his own way, was also blind to the problems of the Middle East, and he was not really, uh, not really fully appreciative of the role of the uh, ideology, the fundamentalist sentiments, etc., that really dictated policies in Iran at that time. So he was trying to peddle his own version of, uh, show China as an example of what both Iran and Iraq should do in opposition to the great powers. So that's, that's, that's something that I wanted to say with regard to Fedos paper also adding some things on China. And just, just to mention a few things about Malcolm's excellent paper, um, it, it, it shows what, what a rigorous scholarly inquiry can achieve even in, the, in spite of difficult access uh, to sources. Uh, I found it quite astonishing that Malcolm was able to reconstruct the details of all these relationships in the form so of, of a, a, such an engaging narrative that reads like a spy novel. And some of the little-known aspects of U.S. policy towards the two contenders and the war are so peculiar um, that they will rival fiction. Uh, and, and they That's not my fault. That's George Caven and, and his, his <laughs> friends. <laughs> But they do raise big questions, I think, about policymaking, the Reagan administration, the structure of policymaking, about uh, administration's priorities as well as blind spots and waging the Cold War. Uh, I think Malcolm is very diplomatic about it in his, in his paper, but, uh, but in, the, um, in the guise of bemusement over U.S. contradictory operations in the Gulf, his paper provides, provides a kind of a, a punch-in-the-face indictment of the Reagan administration's regional policy. Uh, which, uh, which seems to be fairly disastrous. Um, uh, the philosophical underpinnings of this policy, it was premised on equal disdain for both repulsive regimes, was not unreasonable. Who can blame the White House for hoping that they, you know, both sides will lose? But the problems arose in the overzealous pursuit um, of, of, of this particular outcome, which, as we all know, compromised U.S. credibility in the region and also in the long term reinforced apprehensions and mistrust uh, of U.S. intentions among both Iran and Iraq, which played into delusions and paranoia of Saddam Hussein as well as the Iranian leadership. The unfortunate legacy of this involvement, of U.S. involvement, the various unsavory schemes cannot be easily overcome, and it must be taken into consideration even as we discuss, as uh, Shahram Shubin did so eloquently yesterday, Iran's present-day humiliation discourse. Um, now, one thing that I wanted to say about it uh, is that um, um, uh, is, 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 this, is this question 
uh, how a misguided decision like that, and we're talking about, you know, Iran gate here, was put into practice despite significant reservations by people in the senior CIA leadership who did know better. And in the end, it's not very clear whether the CIA's involvement in Iraq and Iran actually helped or hampered U.S. policy in the long term. And I think it's actually uh, 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 hampered U.S. policy. And, and CIA failures, you know, the, here's a broader issue that I would like to, to mention in this regard. CIA failures in, in the Middle East are redeemed only by even a worse track record on the part of the KGB. Um, which often had a similar impact on Soviet policy in the region. Uh, for example, consider how Soviet policy in Iran suffered as a result of the disclosure of the KGB's activities there in the early 1980s was when one of the Soviet um, uh, people, the Soviet residents there defected uh, to, to the British. Uh, and, and, and the result of that was, of course, decapitation of the two there and the Soviet, Soviets lost their channel, main channel influence in Iran. And in Iran was not even an exception with regard to the KGB's uh, uh, um, uh, misadventures. Uh, <laughs> uh, for example, just a note on the side here, uh, similar misfortunes affected Soviet policy towards Japan, which in the 1980s was close to the center of Soviet intelligence gathering activities. Uh, for example, because of the, um, you know, there were revelations of stolen equipment in the 1980s and provision of money to favorite candidates in Japan, uh, you know, uh, which actually did more than more harm than good to Soviet policy. And and what I think very interest is very interesting is that at least CIA veterans are willing to discuss CIA problems and failures in the region, whereas KGB veterans, I'm afraid. Uh, don't do that. Uh, they, you know, they like their track record, I think. <laughs> um, so that's all I wanted to say. Oh, and of course, Pierre's paper, just a couple of comments here. I just want to wonder about uh, France's grand strategy uh, in, in, uh, in, in the Middle East. It seems like the Soviet Union, at least the Soviet Union, okay, it had this uh, misguided grand strategy, I mean, the Arab unity idea, but at least there was some, some, some kind of a grand strategy. The United States had a grand strategy which was based on the premise that the Soviets were tried, trying to uh, dominate Iran, et cetera, which was also based on the false premise because we know the Soviets were nowhere close to any kind of ideas like that, but at least the U.S. also had a grand strategy. But it seems that France is one country that did not have a grand strategy except for making money and I wonder if this is I wonder if this is true okay thank, thank, you. <coughs> thank you Sergey um, we'll open up the floor in, in a moment L let me just um, uh, make a note for the organizers especially those who have done such great work with the um, compilation translation and assessment of the Iraqi sources is this is one example where those who have been working with the Iraqi sources might be able to collaborate with Sveta and Sergey in uh, linking up the s fairly you know, diversely scattered references in the Iraqi sources to Soviet policy with what they have been able to find in the Soviet sources. And I think that would be very valuable because obviously with so much material they haven't been able to scavenge through them to find out what the Iraqis are saying about the Soviets. But I think if you guys could communicate with each other and then see how these two source bases match up or don't, that that would be very valuable. Okay, um, I think uh, unless does anyone have any fast responses to any of Sergey's questions? I will leave. Yes. Oh, Pierre, go ahead very quickly. Uh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Okay. No, but 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 uh, no. The, the the problem at that the time was that the French government had a grand strategy, but only uh, towards two topic: the Cold War. So which means the or three topics. The relation with the US and the Allies, the Cold War, which means the relation with the or the relation or the tensions with the Soviet Union, and we had a real grand strategy on these points, and Africa. But definitely uh, not in the Middle East. The Middle East was out of the scope of the French grand strategy. And toward the Middle East, our two mottos were business and oil. So keep the access to the oil and make uh, money. But just a just two-finger intervention on that. But at the same time, of course, the, the French were also showing finger to the Reagan administration over the Siberian pipeline issue in the yes, early sure. 80s. So it seems that... Uh, Which is that related to both, to money, to oil, and to uh, both the, the, the relation with the U.S. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. Soviet Union. Mm. Okay, thank you. Professor, over here. Here is the first question. Yes, I was... 
bunch of hands. I will we'll call on you. Go ahead. I was going to ask the same question as Sergey, and since you've tried to answer it, I think not altogether successfully, uh, I'd simply make the comment that I hope that France's leading role in Libya is animated now by something more than what <laughs> seemed to be its motives in, the, in Iraq, uh, leading to this calling the Osirak plant Oshirak. Uh, but, but I had a question of both Sergei and Svetlana, which is that the documents come from later on. But in fact, in a sense, let me ask you a question. What was the impact of what was happening to oil prices as a result of the Iran-Iraq war mm -hmm. on the Soviet Union? Because as you know, some people think that uh, mm -hmm. the decline in oil prices had something to do with the eventual uh, events in the Soviet Union. Okay, brief responses. So France and Libya, yes, this is a real issue, and uh, I cannot speak, of course, for the French government. I will just give you my own views. My own views are that there was, again, no uh, conspiracy theory, etc., etc., about the need for Sarkozy, let's say, to instrument. No. Uh, the, the general motto was that uh, the Arab so-called spring has to going on. The general view uh, in Paris was that the French government uh, lost uh, two good initiatives uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt, like, by the way, the U.S. government and that uh, we could not suffer a third uh, failure uh, after. France had and has a complicated uh, history uh, with Libya since the beginning. And you have to keep in mind that France, like the US, by the way, was at war with Gaddafi since the late 70s. And even if it was not an open <laughs> declared war, we were at war with Gaddafi uh, uh, since 1978, when he began to back and play a very nasty role in Chad. And since this moment, uh, we went to, we, and we really fought a real war with the, with the Libyan forces in Chad uh, between 81 and 86, uh, as you know. And we had also strikes on Libyan soil, uh, like the US did, but if it was more in the south and quite discreet. But uh, we were engaged so in a complex and a strong relationship. So there was really a, a tough feeling against Gaddafi. Then the, the motto was also to go and to allow this movement of, let's say, uh, more freedom in the Arab world to develop. Uh, and it was perceived that the Libyan was really a test case, which means that, uh, and it's very interesting to see, by the way, that uh, Bashar, in Syria, Bashar al-Assad began to be very nasty when he saw that Gaddafi began nasty and that nothing happened to him. So uh, it was also, I would say, a sort of pedagogical, and there was a sort of pedagogical aspect and wish to send a very strong message, not only to Gaddafi, but also to Bashar al-Assad and to many others. Okay, sorry. It didn't help. Okay. It didn't uh, help, but it could. Sergei and and it, be, it, be, it continued. Sergey and Sveta, any comment on the oil prices issue? Uh, just, just one comment. Of course, it had a tremendous impact on Soviet policy, but just with respect to <coughs> Iraq, I wonder if there is a connection between uh, the dramatic increase of Soviet aid to, uh, or not aid, sorry, weapons transfers to Iraq, for which the Iraqis paid, of course, with cash uh, in the, uh, after 82, and the notion that the Soviet Union was losing hard currency because of the, uh, uh, the oil, cri uh, oil, oil increase. I would say that um, I agree completely with Sergei that the drop in oil prices, catastrophic drop in oil prices, affected the Soviet policy throughout uh, the Third World, not just here. Here I did not find any uh, references to, uh, well, we can afford it. But <laughs> to what you just said, there is a very interesting uh, statement in May 1987 when Iraq cannot pay their debt. And so the Soviets are, well, 
they say they owe us 2.4 billion dollars in 1987 they can't pay they can they can deliver oil for 1 billion but they don't even they can't even deliver oil for the rest and so the soviets are trying to persuade Iraqi to pay them in oil, which I found kind of funny, uh, but still we should accept that and not lose flexibility. I think uh, one effect clearly of oil prices is that uh, the Soviets find out that this new assertiveness that they wanted to promote, which is mainly uh, trade assertiveness, political involvement, they could not sustain because they could not afford it, and that has a direct relationship but on, on the war. Thank just, you. Just, just mm -hmm. a short one. There's a funny meeting. There's a funny meeting between Gorbachev and I think Tariq Aziz, when which uh, Tariq Aziz complains that Soviet airplanes are too expensive, uh, and 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 Gorbachev uh, and and Tariq Aziz says, well, but the French are cheaper, you know, and then and then and Gorbachev Gorbachev responds as well, but the Americans are more expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amati. Three very brief points. Microphone. One, uh, oh, mi microphone. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, uh, number one, Sergei, say, you said that uh, the superpowers really wanted both sides to lose. This is a very uh, uh, negative approach, and Israel, you, want, you wanted them both to win. Um, uh, then uh, the French approach. I was approached by two French experts who came to me in 1986 after the, later, later in the, after the foul peninsula was lost. And they told me very clearly France was going to change sides and s drop Iraq like a rotten apple and start working with the Iranians. I said to them, why? And they said, because Iraq is going to lose this war. It's losing the war. So I told them what I thought, that Iraq was not going to lose the war. It cannot win, but it won't lose. In fact, it found a way of uh, neutralizing uh, effectively the Iranian human waves and all that. And I don't know if it made any impact, but uh, to me, the French approach was very strange. Um, three, uh, about what Malcolm said, fascinating, fascinating. And uh, some people here said, some of our colleagues said here uh, at Cat Cathedral that uh, Saddam is a strange man. He couldn't understand the Americans. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Do I have to answer uh, that? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, over here? Yes. Oh, a quick question, well, comment? A very small comment about both sides wanting them to lose. I think there is a difference, and it's slight but significant. The Soviets did not want either side to win, but they did not want both sides to lose because they did not see both Iran and Iraq weakened because if that happened, then, the, uh, then Saudi Arabia and Israel, which are very pro-American, would play a major role in the Middle East. So what the Soviets wanted is really the status, ante, uh, status quo antebellum to have those both relatively strong actors with the Soviets being able to balance between them. Okay, over here. David Newton, just uh, two questions. Number one, the refusal to meet Tark Aziz in 82, cutting off arms, must have been a great incentive for the Iraqis to start talking to the Americans and a great incentive for the Americans to get one up on the Soviets. I wonder if there's anything in the documents that suggests that. The second one was uh, the last comment about the U.S. fears of the Soviet Union and Iran being exaggerated. I guess my question is, was this a real fear, or was it largely hyped in order to justify uh, Iran Gate? Uh, Graham Fuller's uh, Special National Intelligence Estimate certainly made that strong case. I, I met him afterwards and said, uh, did you really mean this? Could you really think this way? And he said, well, I was just trying to be a gadfly. <laughs> but was this true, or do you think this was manufactured as a justification? And, and I would just add for Malcolm, you know, I, I remember because we were both deeply involved in the Iran-Contra excavations uh, of, of, of the materials, you know, there are references to embellished or fabricated <laughs> intelligence to uh, encourage Soviet, uh, Iranian fears of the Soviets. And, you know, I wonder if you want to elaborate on that since you didn't get to it in your verbal presentation. I know you mentioned it in your paper. And I don't know if George would want to add anything uh, about ha the balance between intelligence about uh, Iraq to be provided to the Iranians versus uh, concerns about the Soviets to try to encourage the Iranians to come into the back to the Americans. Right. Um, I should say that 
you know, really everybody who contributed to our various projects who's sitting in the audience should be up here answering these questions because <laughs> I'm just, you know, interpreting what, uh, what they said, the incredibly valuable information that they passed on. Um, my sense of uh, the, the fear of Soviet aggression is that it's kind of a mixed bag. It depends on who you're talking about. If you're talking about some of the gentlemen here in this room who focused on Arab affairs and Middle East, there was no realistic sense that the Soviets were uh, a threat. Uh, but if you're talking about others in the administration, up, up to and including the president and including people like Bud McFarlane uh, and others, uh, who? Don Regan. Don Regan. Then that is the shibboleth. I mean, that's the big, you know, the big fear. And it's clearly something that animates the policy level documents that are supposed to uh, be the underpinnings for the Iran arms deals. Um, I had uh, an interview just recently with Sandra Charles, who was in the DOD in, in uh, the OSD, and she remembers a, an interagency meeting uh, that Graham Fuller was at, and I think Howard Teicher was at. I don't know if Howard's here today, but um, her recollection of the meeting was that they floated this idea uh, that the Soviets were, were on the, the move and that Iran was, was uh, folding at that point in the war, which I think was not accurate at that time. Um, and that therefore we should consider this idea of allowing certain Western arms to go to Iran. And she said the reaction in the room was basically, this is insane, what are you talking about? And they kind of laughed it off and they left and, and thought it was over and done with. And the next thing they knew, Casper uh, Weinberger was sending down for review a draft national security decision directive that McFarlane had, had um, uh, generated that, you know, was, was the document that supposedly um, – uh, proposed this idea on a formal level. So her conclusion was that uh, this trial balloon uh, sank dramatically at the interagency at the, the lower levels, and McFarland just said, well, forget it. I'm going uh, over your heads to the top levels. Uh, on the question that Jim posed that relates to uh, specifically to the meeting in Tehran that George was at and Howard was at, uh, where, George, we got some of your, your memos that the Iran-Contra committees helpfully made public uh, that give the clear sense that uh, although there may have been a sense on your part and Bob Gates's part, certainly, that the Soviets were uh, doing these war games and, and presenting a potential threat in terms of an invasion of Iran, that you guys were really trying also to pump that up somewhat to get the Iranians' attention to the point of uh, for the benefit of, of the audio devices that you assumed were in your hotel room at the Estaclal Hotel, uh, you, you talked among yourselves about this vaunted source, Vladimir, who actually didn't exist. Maybe he did, I'm, and maybe I'm not reading it right. But just to say to the Iranians, wow, this is really hot stuff, and, and hope that they would be interested, but they didn't, uh, they didn't bite, as I understand it. I'd love to hear your reactions. Sorry, if I Wait, I'll hear George Cave's reaction first. Um, this is kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Take notes. <laughs> uh, I had to give a briefing, but when we went to Tehran, I gave a briefing on the threat of a Soviet invasion of Iran. And the only facts in this is that the Soviet military would, as part of their war games, practice every couple of years a, inv an invasion of Iran. And I did this supported by overhead, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just, and this was done not well. I did, didn't want to do it. It was uh, McFarlane and North's idea that we'll have them, we want to get them to fear the Soviets. And Vladimir was a figment of Ali's imagination. <laughs> but actually, the Iranians, we were on the top floor of the Hilton Hotel. The LP, all the rooms were bugged. Uh, and the LP for it was in one of the rooms, and I was supposed to knock on that door if we needed something. And every time I knocked on that door, it would be absolutely black inside, even if it was the middle of the day. And uh, the Iranians, in the formal sessions, would not respond very well. However, they would pull me aside out in the hall if they really wanted to get a message across <laughs> without it being recorded. Now, well, <coughs> getting around to sort of putting to rest just what we gave the Irans in the way of military information, it was really very little. 
And part of the problem was is that we never got to sit down with a, a babble of you know uh, military officers like our guy in Iraq, where when we brought stuff in, we would meet with a whole collection of uh, Iraqi military. In Iran, the only two guys we dealt with were t two Rev Guards, and relatively young. One was the, one was the head of uh, Rev Guard intelligence. And the nephew, now in the September meeting, the nephew asked us for some specifics. And he said, look, we can cover the Iraqi frontline positions pretty well. Our problem is trying to keep up with what is going on behind the lines. And he asked for our help in that. And we never produce much. Now, in order to get us more involved, he was under instructions to ask us, this is during the September meeting, to get involved with them in supplying arms uh, in Afghanistan, saying you can do it much more efficiently if you bring the arm, bring the stuff you're supplying them in through Shah Bihar. And he even said, George will set you up in Mashhad, which uh, I declined. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but the one thing he did do, he says, you know, we've already got um, uh, gotten ten of your stingers from our um, our contacts in, in uh, Afghanistan. Now, when we met with both of these guys in Frankfurt after this in, in October, uh, in order to get our interest, the uh, head of uh, the head of IRGC intelligence brought us a huge detailed map that he spread on the floor of the Soviet positions in Afghanistan. And I took that back to our headquarters and they were very much impressed because it was extremely accurate. Uh, we had one more meeting in, in oh, um, Mainz, Mainz, and this was just with the nephew, where he warned us that the uh, McFarland <coughs> mission had appeared in a small newspaper in Baalbek on the 28th of October and warned us that, you know, something might happen. And we only had one more meeting and that was with the um, Rev Guard in, uh, in Geneva. And then the whole thing collapsed when Charlie, Ambassador Charlie Dunbar and I went and met with the Rev Guard Intelligence Chief and in Frankfurt and read him a note that Charlotte George Schultz had written saying it's all over, basically. So he got up and just left. And in January, I did the last thing I called the number that they had set up for me in Tehran, saying, <coughs> you said, Chora uh, Hafez. There was only one last point I wanted to make is when we gave the briefing to um, Yazdi and Amir Entazam, when the briefing was over, I'll never forget this, Yazdi said, Jorat Nemikunan, in other words, they wouldn't dare invade. And his opinion was so different from Amir Entazam's <coughs> opinion. He accepted everything we said and, of course, insisted that I stay for an extra day and brief him on, um, on uh, the IBEX the IBEX program. But that's about all I care to say about Iran country. <laughs> I, I felt like a character out of uh, Heller's book, uh, you know, Catch-22. <laughs> How can you ever aid both sides in a war? Thank you, uh, George, for adding to the record. And, and by the way, um, uh, for anyone who, who's not aware, it's a little-known aspect of the Iran arms sales that there was always a small fraction of the arms that were intended to go to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to help open up uh, U.S. support for the other front in Afghanistan. And there's a, an article on this issue in the, the journal Cold War is History, if anyone's interested. Let me turn to Nigel. Just first of all, I want to bring us back to Ambassador Newton's question, because this was also puzzling me. Um, June 1982, the Soviets refused to meet Tariq Aziz, and King Hussein comes back from Moscow saying the Soviets have told him they're thinking about moving 
units away from the Iranian border to allow Iran to release more forces to put pressure on Iraq. Now, this is the point in the war where uh, Iraq is probably most vulnerable to losing. How is this a strategy of trying to make sure that you, you keep kind of a balance? This looks like a strategy of, of you know, risking uh, Iraqi defeat at this point. The second one is just a comment about this question of France having um, a grand strategy. In fact, what you find is very similar with Britain. Uh, the Thatcher government's approach to the Middle East is basically all about selling weapons uh, and making money. And what you see, uh, the same sort of period, beginning of the war, the, the head of uh, British defense sales uh, goes out in a King Hussein's private plane, in fact, takes him over to uh, Baghdad to meet Saddam, and they have conversations about various uh, military contracts. Also, at the same time, um, which is something, of course, Margaret Thatcher denies later on in the, the Scott inquiry in the 90s, you know, they're well aware that Jordan is acting as a conduit uh, for arms uh, to Iraq. They know that's uh, going on. So really, the British grand strategy, in the sense that they have one, is pretty much the same as the French. It's, it's to make money out of this. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Sveta, do you care to respond? or, or uh, Just very you? briefly, um, I really... It is a mystery to me, but I think the way I would explain it is that the, this initial period um, until kind of summer, fall 1982, is when the Soviets tried to present this facade of strict neutrality. And maybe, maybe that is why they refused to see Aziz. Um, in the summer of 82, but because I don't know well the information on the actual uh, military advances, I can't, you know, say how the Soviets reacted to Iraq's vulnerability from the uh, material that I've read. In 82, the Soviets were still perceiving Iraq to be pretty strong. But again, I, you know, maybe I just don't know that particular. Uh, Malcolm had a quick comment, then Pierre. Yeah, connected to Nigel's thing. Yes, d uh, no, I fully agree with uh, Nigel's comment, and uh, I don't want to elaborate neither on, German, on Germany or on uh, the UK because it's not my role, but uh, I have a lot of information also on these two countries. Uh, just a point to uh, what you said to, uh, in Israel towards so the, the French attitude uh, towards Iran, uh, I, I fully disagree, which means that I can ensure you that at the top level there was a French uh, wish to do everything to prevent Iraq losing the war. And if these two uh, persons told you that, uh, it was just not the, the truth. And if they did that, I suppose that uh, they come from the intelligence community or the French communi uh, intelligence. Okay, so uh, it's even better. It's just because, no, no. It's just because uh, when I said in France that there was um, there was a, a large political consensus on the policy to back Iraq. This is true, but it means that inside each political party and in inside the French government, you had two lobbies. You had the pro-Arab and the pro-Israeli <coughs> lobbies, and the pro-Israeli lobbies was also the pro-Iranian lobby. So it means that, or it means that the people who met were probably people who were uh, very against, I would say, the, <coughs> the business with Iraq and very in favor of strong relations with Israel and with Iran, which is a, a great classical in the French um, foreign policy. So uh, what they told you was absolutely not, well, that was probably their views, but it was not the view of the French government and uh, on the French authorities, because at that moment, I can ensure you that there was a strong will to uh, continue to back Iraq. Yes, we change our policy, we moderate our policy, but it was for the, region, for the reasons uh, that I mentioned, mainly the, the negotiation of the hostages uh, with Iran. But we had even in mind, and we had always, I would say, kept in the, in the margin some, uh, some contracts that uh, we considered to honor even if Iraq was not able to, to pay. And for example, in 86 and 87, 
when the things uh, began to be very badly uh, or to go quite badly for Iraq, we we gave them we sold or we sold them uh, new batches of uh, Mirage fighters and uh, of different equipments. Uh, I, I just say nearly for free, just because we wanted absolutely to preserve Iraq. So it's really uh, in contradiction of uh, what these people told you. Okay. Malcolm, you had a short comment. Uh, very short, just to um, uh, give another piece of evidence of the convergence of strategic visions <coughs> between the British and the French, at least, um, uh, keeping in mind what Pierre uh, told us at the beginning of his talk. Uh, there's a document from the British archives that we have up on our website, the National Security Archive, uh, from 1969, where the British Embassy, somebody from there, goes and visits Saddam and comes away and reports home that he is a, quote, presentable young man with an engaging smile <laughs> and echoing the French phrase that he says the British should be ready to do business with him. Okay. Over here. Okay. Uh, microphone. Uh, Raymond Zelanskis from Monterey Institute. So I'm wondering, with the in yesterday we heard from the, uh, um, the Iraqi general uh, um, that uh, with every SAM-2 and every SAM-3 installation they had, there were Russian experts that were present there. So in view of these massive sales of military equipment, I just wonder how, how much further did that go? Was there, for example, instructions in, in tactics, how to use tactics in the field? Or when they sold the tanks, you know the Soviet tanks had air handling systems to protect against radiological, chemical, and biological weapons? Were there instructions on how to defend against chemical weapons, for example? How far did that go on that level? I can only answer part of this question. I hope maybe Sergei can help me. Yes, you're <coughs> absolutely right, pointing uh, to the fact that there were thousands of Soviet advisors um, with the equipment, and it was all called uh, special cooperation or special equipment. And that, of course, creates a big problem for the Soviet Union after the invasion of Kuwait, where you have 3,000 uh, specialists, experts, who are advisors who you need to evacuate, and the Iraqis are holding them. Um, uh, how much advice on tactical um, operations? We, we simply don't know because of the absence of the documents. Um, I would assume there was some advice. Um, as to chemical weapons, the Soviets themselves were very careful about it, and <coughs> I do not believe there was much cooperation on that, but again, until we see the documents. Um, expertise, uh, technical expertise, military expertise, also Iraqis came and studied in Soviet institutions, clearly was there. How, how far uh, from the, you know, in, in terms of time, from 1972 when they signed the uh, Friendship and Cooperation Treaty, they were expanding the military cooperation every year, practically until 1980. Thank you, Sveta. And I would just add, by the way, to the organizers here, um, since Sveta mentioned the Soviet advisors who were still in Iraq at the time of the invasion uh, of Kuwait, that there's massive never translated documentation yeah. in the Gorbachev Foundation about the diplomacy of the uh, uh, of late 1990 leading up to the war against Iraq in early 1991 and Gorbachev's intense diplomacy. And I know there was a conference at the Bush uh, Presidential Library on that war, but it would be very worthwhile to sponsor some sort of workshop in Moscow uh, on the Soviet dimension of that crisis, because that really has never really come out, and yet it's much easier to bring out than some of this story. I just want to completely support Jim in this. There is so much more documentation on the Persian Gulf War. And, uh, of even 1991. Looking, yeah, even looking at the Politburo, the level of discussion, uh, the level of contacts, the memcons is all there, memoirs, people are still Primakov's alive. Primakov's trips. Yeah, Primakov's trips, his own materials. Um, it it was seen as much more important to Soviet foreign policy than the Iran Iraq War, and, and that just requires money. The, the materials just, are all, yeah, and yeah, access yeah. are already there. Any, Am any Ambassador any. Murphy, I think you had a comment. Well, to compliment all of the panelists, uh, I derived an almost perverse sense of pleasure hearing <laughs> about the different currents of opinion in Paris and Moscow, even a bit on London. Um, I felt kind of guilty over the years that 
things could get so confused in Washington, but it's a pleasure to find you were <laughs> all in much the same condition. Uh, I, I gave a briefing to the French foreign minister about our policy efforts in Lebanon in 88, just at the time of the failed election there, and he was very appreciative, and I thought it was a particularly clear, lucid, persuasive presentation. He gave a press conference the next morning saying the problem is that the Americans are so impetuous and maladroit. <laughs> that, that was just before France sent a cruiser to the uh, eastern uh, Mediterranean to demonstrate French influence and the Syrians got so upset the cruiser was immediately recalled to uh, its port in France. But what I'm hearing is confusion in a very complicated set of circumstances. Uh, certainly a degree of ineptitude and p political decision-making at the very top. It's this way, win-win or lose-lose. There was yet another voice, which was that in our own bureau, which uh, hasn't been mentioned. Uh, the concern we had at the, call it the working level, about the war was that the danger of its spreading, infecting the situation in the small Gulf states and even in Saudi Arabia was constant. The, the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis, the uh, uh, Abu Dhabians talking about Dubai opening its doors to Iranian agents, uh, the sense of uh, Iran on the march uh, uh, in sabotage and sponsoring events like the blowing up of the uh, uh, embassy in Kuwait in 83, I think December 83. Um, we were getting very protective about bringing the war to an end, not to seeing the win-win or lose-lose equation, but the war was dangerous the longer it went on. Thank you. Um, it's noon. I have license uh, to let the panel run over a little bit, but let's co collect remaining questions for the panel. There was a question back there. Thank you. Um, my name is Farzin Nadimi. I'm with York Center for International and Security Studies in Toronto. Uh, I would rather call the Soviet policy toward the Iran-Iraq war opportunistic. Well, whose wasn't, but uh, certainly not, uh, uh, not consistent. Uh, during the early days of the war, uh, when, when Britain and, and, and the UN were trying to find a when the end to the uh, war, the Soviet Union, on 25th of September, for example, joined, uh, joined Iraq to block a UN Security Council meeting for the time being. The Soviets obviously weren't certain about the uh, serious about the settlements in, in, in those early days of the conflict, probably because uh, they had been assured by Iraq of a quick and decisive end to it. It was mainly Soviets uh, that sh uh, slowed or even blocked the attempts toward uh, 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 s such an end, fearing and antagonizing Iraq. Yes, they refused to sell Iraq uh, long-range SS-12 missiles, forcing Iraqis to modify their own Scott missiles, but they also modified Iraqi long-range reconnaissance MiG-25 aircraft to, uh, with, uh, to carry bombs to pound Tehran and gave Iraq enough regular Scott missiles that they could scrap three to, to build one Al Hussein missiles, missile. The, the, the Soviets refused to sell Iran surface-to-surface -surface missiles, uh, but they also gave green light to Libya to sell them to Iran. And when Saddam protested, the Soviets pressured the Libyan technicians uh, to sabotage the remaining missiles and, and, and leave Iran. Um, just, just, just make this comment. Hey, thank you, and I think there was one more question over here. Thank you so much. My name is Ariad Amri. I work at the Uniformed Service University. Uh, I had two comments. One of them was about the missiles. It already has been mentioned. The other thing is that uh, in 1988, I was doing my internship in a Rashid military hospital. It was the flagship hospital of the Iraqi army by that time. Uh, by uh, uh, by March to, uh, 1988, uh, there has been some preparations in the hospital uh, to prepare some isolated wards for soldiers that's going to be br brought to the hospital. 
that was in the sixth, uh, sixth uh, war, uh, surgical ward in Rashid Military Hospital. Uh, I was doing my internship exactly in that ward in the hospital. Uh, later on, we've received soldiers with chemical injuries. That was uh, the Battle of Al Fao liberation. By that time, the uh, battles of liberation of the of the territory that has been taken by, by Iran has started in Iraq. Uh, we I've known from personally from those soldiers that uh, most of their injuries was because of chemical weapons that has been used by the Iraqi army, because many of them were pro from the Republican Guards from uh, from Al Fao where the battle had occurred. Uh, later on, we've, re we've received some soldiers from other battles, from Amrsas Island, from Shalamcha and al Psetin, which are battles in the, on the border. Also, we've, re 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 we've received soldiers from, uh, uh, from uh, that has been injured by chemical weapons. And we knew later that uh, they had two difficult uh, signs and symptoms of, it seems to be they have been uh, exposed to two different kinds of chemical weapons. Uh, most of them were from the, from the Iraqi army, but also, we've received uh, soldiers that has been uh, affected by uh, arms, uh, by uh, weapons that has been used from the Iranian army. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, final comments? Uh, Sveta, do you want to respond about the comments of uh, Soviet policy and then Sergei? Um, yeah, I wanted to respond to that comment and to Sergei when he said in the beginning. Um, apart opportunistic, yes, of course it was opportunistic. Um, I initially, uh, the, what you said that the Soviets were assured of Iraqi quick uh, campaign, the Soviets were extremely unhappy with Iraqi campaign, and they felt Iraqi humiliated them by doing it kind of behind their back and destabilizing the region. So I don't see any proof uh, that the Soviets were actually happy or uh, supportive of that. Um, yes, you know, in terms of supplying the weapons, they they tried to uh, balance in such a way that no one country would win predominantly. Um, although when they um, saw that Iraqi was actually, the Iraqi side was actually losing, they stepped up weapons uh, deliveries uh, quite substantially. It was opportunistic, but it did have uh, a priority, and I think they followed uh, uh, that priority pretty consistently. Um, on, on Sergei's comment, I would uh, mention two things. You said that the Soviet um, pol uh, policy in the Middle East was anti-American. I would correct it a little bit. It was not anti-American. This is an important dis distinction. It was competitive. And the whole idea was that Gorbachev believed, and people close to him believed, that there was enough attractiveness in the Soviet model, and they could actually reach out to all those important big states. It's kind of a new realist approach. Um, not necessarily to uh, hurt the American interests, but to establish their presence and real connections, not just based on ideology, but based on real interests, trade, uh, political leverage, and even Arab unity, which was quite, uh, quite a naive thought. But they went pretty far with uh, being flexible uh, with their traditional stances. For example, in 1986, they, are, they believe so much that they could bring the peace to the Middle East, and they could play this role, that they actually discuss at the Politburo that they should give up the idea of independent Palestinian state as a condition. And that, if that could bring about resolution of the Mi Middle Eastern crisis. But it was not anti-American, even though some rhetoric was still old rhetoric, but that's what they talk at the Politburo. Second, um, you said that you would date the turn in Gorbachev's policy to 1988. I agree with you generally on the Middle East and the Third World, and probably would be early 1988, but on the Iran-Iraq war specifically, there is a pronounced turn, the pronounced changed shift to negotiating with the United States as the main partner in mid-1987, and that's around the consultations about the UN resolution. Um, that's all. Okay, Sergey, I sense rising hunger, so relatively brief <laughs> closing comments. <laughs> 
I, <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, well, I mean, we just disagree on this point, so I will not make uh, comments on this point. But just one comment that I wanted to add about uh, about Soviet policymaking with regard to Iran Iraq War in the early 80s, especially 82. Uh, one thing that we have to be aware of is that in 82, uh, uh, Soviet leadership was not in the best state. Uh, <coughs> and in fact, uh, Brezhnev was in such a bad state at that time, he didn't really realize what he was doing. He was signing his name on different things uh, based on what his advisors were telling him. But his advisor had different advisors at different times. And one would say one thing, another another thing. Uh, and so this makes for a very complicated kind of policy making environment, which I think uh, is, is, is a major reason why we can not really uh, uh, see uh, any kind of a consistent Soviet policy with regard to this region in 1982. Thanks. Malk, you had a closing comment? Just a, a quick answer to what I think was a question about Iranian chemical weapons use. There are a couple of scattered CIA documents that mention the possibility of that occurring, but I don't know of anything that confirms it. Uh, as far as I know, there is evidence that Iran had the capacity or was building the capacity for certain kinds of weapons, but I don't know that they were ever used. And the person who does know is Joost Hilterman, who you should talk to afterwards. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next panel starts at 1.30, so uh, we can adjourn for lunch and lunchtime conversation. Please join me in thanking our panel.